while folks are still standing in line for what smells like a spectacular meal, we're going to get started. And I am here technically representing this semester's open classroom because together with my colleague and dear friend Ted Landsmark, we have been leading a series of discussions over the course of the semester grounded in the recent release of what we're calling principal, principles of anti-oppressive community engagement for university faculty and researchers. That concept gave us a basis to bring together people from all over campus who are engaging with community partners with a focus on equity and justice, on co-creation and co-ownership, on trying to embody the values of racial and social justice from the conceptualization of a project through its implementation and evaluation. We know this work takes many, many forms, and one that we are celebrating tonight and so happy to share the space of open classroom with is the launch of the new Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub here at Northeastern University. For those of you who are joining us online, you'll see that we're mixing up the format a little bit. We have folks here in person, and there's a meal that I'm sorry we can't share with you online. I hope you're all taking time to just get a really good dinner for yourselves while you're watching, and know that um, we are all here together because we care so much about the notion of climate and environmental justice. What we're gonna do tonight is a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna step aside. We have a whole panel that is going to manage itself under the direction of our dear friend and often co-conspirator, Dr. Atia Martin. Um, she will be up here in a minute with some uh, colleagues, some collaborators, uh, to talk about what it means to have a climate justice and sustainability hub on campus. But first, I am very excited to pass things over to our colleague, Kathy Spiegelman. I wanna get your title right, Kathy, because the work you do on campus is so important as the Vice President and Chief of Planning, Real Estate and Facilities. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Oh, and before, I was supposed to take a temperature check. We had somebody who said it would be really helpful to know who is here in person with us tonight. So let me do that really quick before I step away from the mic. How many of you are students? Can we see us? Lots of students, yes. We know this is an issue that's important to you. Thank you for your leadership and your relentless pursuit of climate justice and getting us to do the right thing here on campus. We appreciate that. How about faculty and staff? All right. And thank you all for following the lead of the young people who are taking a stand and making sure that we do the right thing to protect their futures. And with that, Kathy, I will pass the mic over to you. Uh, well, welcome, uh, everyone, uh, students, neighbors, colleagues, uh, and guests. Uh, I feel very privileged uh, to be able to be here tonight, and I feel very privileged to be part of launching uh, the Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub. Um, I also want to thank the members of the panel who are um, going to share their expertise with us, uh, and a special thank you to Ted Landsmark and Rebecca Riccio. Um, for coordinating this event with the Myra Craft Open Classroom, um, whose theme uh, this semester is the perfect backdrop for this conversation. And I'll, I'll just quote a piece of it from their website, in case you're not familiar. Uh, to explore a variety of community-centered research initiatives grounded in racial and social justice values and a commitment to working with community members as co-equals. Uh, and we all share in that. Northeastern's Department of Facilities Management has been striving to implement sustainable practices on campus for more than a decade. But the recent reorganization that has merged our planning, our real estate, and our facilities into one united organization provides both a responsibility and an opportunity to expand our dedication to improving the practices and take advantage of the resources, like the people in this room, on campus and in our commun the community of which we are a part. To do this, we've created the Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub 
and hired its leader, Leah Bamberger, who comes to us from a successful climate justice program for the city of Providence, Rhode Island. Leah and her team will work to elevate the university's ability to leverage ideas and actions across the global locations in the Northeastern Network, where we together are facing the challenges of a sustainable and equitable quality of life. If the hub is to be successful, it will need to encourage people like this audience to stay involved and work with us. We want to create an opportunity to connect across disciplines and connect research and learning to real world problem solving, realizing the potential of Northeastern's experiential education philosophy. I'm now going to turn it over to Leah Bamberger, who's our founding executive director of the Northeastern Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub, and she will more formally introduce to you the goals of the hub and what lies ahead for all of us. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here in this full room. I think many of you can relate when you throw a party or an event, you're always worried, is anyone gonna show up? Um, and especially being new here to the Northeastern community, um, just so feel so uh, privileged to have uh, you all here in the room this evening and to help us launch Northeastern's Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub. Um, so I wanted to echo the, the, the thanks for uh, sharing the Meyer uh, Croft uh, uh, Open Classroom series with us and, and opening the stage for us to talk a little bit about the hub and get into this conversation with staff, faculty, students, and community members. Um, unfortunately, we had two spectacular panelists that uh, both fell ill this morning and were not able to be here. And so, uh, unfortunately, we will not have the perspective of our, of our neighboring communities with us this evening. But um, it is a very important part of this work, and we are going to continue to uh, make sure to include uh, their perspectives as we move forward. So as um, Kathy described, the Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub was created to harness the talents from the Northeastern community and connect them to real world challenges and partners so we can solve the climate crisis while addressing social justice and equality. And inequality. As a newcomer to Northeastern, it has been such a pleasure getting to know the community here and I'm delighted to share some of the opportunities and of course the challenges for the Hub's work ahead. Northeastern is home to an incredible force of research and intellect. There are over 150 faculty engaged in sustainability research and with nearly 200 interdisciplinary sustainability course offer offerings leading to a certificate or degree, Northeastern's curriculum provides a rich, deep understanding of what's necessary to sustain our cities, oceans, and environment. While there is still room for improvement, much of this research and learning is being done in partnership with local communities. For example, Professor Landsmark and Professor Fitzgerald, who is one of our panelists this evening, are working on Boston's Climate Progress Report. Professor Wiley is exploring natural gas leaks across the state of Massachusetts with Mothers Out Front, as well as working with Green Roots Chelsea on understanding our region's dependency on the polluting industries in Chelsea. Like many colleges and universities today, students bring energy, urgency, and leadership to this issue that is so critical to their future. I believe those who are most impacted by the problem should always be centered in the process of solving the problem. Young people, in many ways, have the most at stake, most at stake if we don't dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the next eight years. Not only are Northeastern students concerned and demanding action, but they are taking matters into their own hands from taking advantage of co-ops with sustainability-oriented businesses and nonprofits to class projects on campus. I was blown away by students in Professor Wiley's uh, class who shared some of their projects earlier this semester. This picture here on the top right is the, the deliverable of that project. And the students sat outside of Starbucks for one hour and counted the amount of disposable cups that left Starbucks. And they counted 127 cups in just 16 minutes. That's more than two cups per minute. And they took the caps 
uh, from the, the cups, and they created these, these artistic uh, koi fish and suspended them over the pond. And the number of students, just in the you know, 15 minutes that we were out there, they were showcasing the project, the number of passerbyers that, that stopped and asked what was going on and were curious was extremely impressive, and it shows really the power of engaging arts and advocacy. Perhaps our most strategic advantage for the hub's success is Northeastern's roots in professional studies and experiential learning. Northeastern was founded as an evening school for working professionals. It has expanded this value of professional experience and service learning through the co-op program, the global exchange office, the experiential network, and more. The development of the global network creates even more chances for students to grow their experience and apply their learnings. This is an incredible opportunity for students and faculty to tackle this global challenge. And of course, our main campus is and always will be here in Boston. Boston, as well as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, have long been leaders in climate and sustainability. However, with new and energized leadership in City Hall and a growing youth and BIPOC-led movement, Boston is in a great position to show the world what a just and equitable transition away from fossil fuels could look like. And lastly, Northeastern has a strong foundation of leading on climate and sustainability. We just completed our fifth campus-wide lighting retrofit, saving over 3 million kilowatt hours per year. Our two newest buildings, ISEC and Building 5 in Burlington, achieved LEED Gold certification. And as an interim solution, the Boston campus has achieved carbon neutrality through the purchase of carbon offsets. Increasingly, Northeastern is also exploring ways to enhance the community benefits of our climate efforts. For example, we've contracted with Cerro, a Roxbury-based uh, worker-owned cooperative, to provide our composting services for the campus. And soon, Northeastern will host Good to Go, an equity-focused, income-tiered electric car share that's based in Roxbury. And I believe there's a representative from Good to Go here this evening. Excellent, thank you. But of course, there are still challenges ahead. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Students are pushing the university to divest from fossil fuels. Our neighbors want to see more done to mitigate the impacts of Northeastern's growth on their community. And our student body is still predominantly white, especially in the environmental fields. And of course, the climate crisis is far from solved, leaving us ample opportunities to collaborate and uh, for, for more collaborative and impactful research and learning. So how are we gonna get there? Well, that's certainly the question that we're here tonight to discuss, um, but we did do some initial thinking to get us started, and uh, I'd like to share um, some, these are the five draft goals that we've um, crafted for the Hub. And again, this is going to be a long process of refining and getting more input from you all here and from members of our community. But we do know that Northeastern must become a fossil fuel free institution by 2040, if not sooner. We also know that our campuses should be models of sustainable, resilient, healthy, and inclusive communities. Northeastern must contribute to a just and regenerative economy, both locally and globally. We must collaborate with adjacent communities to contribute to equitable and sustainable neighborhoods. And we must leverage the research and academic strengths of Northeastern to ad advance just and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. So how can we get there? We have some initial ideas um, about how Northeastern can make progress towards these goals. And again, this is just a starting point. But first, we can help organize and coordinate all of the incredible work that is happening throughout the Northeastern community. By no means do we want to serve as a clearinghouse or try to lead and, and manage all of the great work that's already happening, but I do think there's an opportunity to help elevate, support, and provide shape to these various efforts. Second, we must do good by our neighbors. Northeastern's growth has often come at the expense of its relationship with its neighbors, and this does not have to be the case. We must be prepared to dig into the root cause of these tensions and build authentic relationships and trust. Good relationships are not built on, built on transactions or gifts. They are built on shared values, trust, and honesty. 
We will work closely with our partners in external affairs and community relations and others to build upon and support the work that is already being done. Lastly, we must continue to lead by example and push the envelope of what it means to be a sustainable and equitable university. We'll need to be more vocal, not only about our successes, but also about our areas of growth. We must also advocate for more aggressive climate policies. We'll be in a much better position to meet our goals if we are operating in a policy landscape that aligns with them. So what's next? To get this work started, we're building off of the past climate justice action planning process that's taking place on campus. Uh, many of you were probably a part of that. And we're launching a collaborative planning process. And this is really, this is starting tonight, so thank you for being a part of it. The process will have an enhanced focus on engaging our neighboring community members and other climate and environmental justice advocates in the Boston area. We'll have a steering committee of students, faculty, and community members to guide the process. And with the help of an equity consultant, we'll do trainings on racial and climate justice and ensure that we're centering the lived experiences of our neighbors, as well as digging deep into structural racism. And if everything goes according to plan, as it always does, we will have our climate justice plan around this time next year. So um, for the sake of time, uh, we're gonna um, transition into our panel, but there are a few uh, different ways, I'm sure many of you may have questions or comments and we really wanna capture that feedback. So you may have noticed there's some fun paper uh, provided by Karen, our graphical note taker. Um, we encourage you to doodle, draw, take down notes, write questions, comments, feedback. Um, throughout the presentation in the panel. If you're joining virtually, please um, share your comments and thoughts in the chat, and we'll be sure to capture that um, at the end of the event. Um, and um, with the, the papers on the table, you can either just leave them behind or hand them to a member of my team. And speaking of my team, I just wanna do a quick uh, gratitude to my colleagues, Jacob, Megan, Adam, Brittany, Caitlin, and Evan, who are here this evening. Actually, Adam's coming later, but nonetheless. Um, so just a quick round of applause for their help in pulling this event off. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to invite our panelists and uh, Dr. Atia Martin, who will be uh, joining us to moderate the panel. I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Martin years ago when we both worked for the city of Boston. She has extensive experience uh, building bridges between institutions and community, especially when it comes to climate resilience. I'm so thrilled she's able to join us here today and we are very lucky to have her. Please welcome Dr. Martin. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing, this QR code on the screen here, it actually uh, takes you to a sneak preview of our, of our website, which is another area that we welcome feedback on. And I learned from some of our student workers that if you just, Put your camera up and try to take a picture of that. It will take you right to the link. It's magical, even if you're sitting in the back. Um, so grab that if you'd like to take a look at the new website. We hope to go live with that soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Happy Wednesday, everyone. My name is Dr. Atia Martin. Can you hear me okay? All right. Awesomeness. So. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion about some of the opportunities that are possible for the sustainability hub. Um, and so we're first gonna begin by introducing ourselves and then we're gonna go into a series of questions really that are meant to explore where those opportunities are. Um, and so to kick us off, I will model uh, where we're going with this conversation. And so my name is Dr. Atia Martin. I'm the CEO and founder of All Aces Inc. and the executive director of a nonprofit called Next Leadership Development. Um, the most important thing to know about me is that my husband and I have five children, two still at home, and three grandbabies. So life is real, is, is, is in, in a, in a uh, short way to say that. Um, and I used to be the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Boston, as well as the Director of Public Health Preparedness uh, for um, the Boston Public Health Commission, which is also part of the City of Boston. So I'm gonna pass it over to the wonderful Professor Joan Fitzgerald to, to introduce herself, and as a reminder for my fellow panelists, to remember to turn your microphone on. Uh, 
So it's up to you. So the question was, are we wearing masks on stage or not? I keep my mask on because I'm high risk, but you're welcome to take your mask off. Keep it on if you'd like. Okay, <clears throat> Professor Joan Fitzgerald. Thank you, Atiyah. I'm Joan Fitzgerald. I'm a professor in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. I guess an important thing to know about me is that I have spent my entire career uh, focusing on cities and the link between economic opportunity, sustainability, and equity. Well done. Look at you. Okay. And we're going to uh, pass it right on down to the wonderful <laughs> Carl Reed in order to introduce himself. Great. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm Carl Reed. I'm the uh, Senior Vice Provost and Chief Inclusion Officer for Northeastern University. Just crossed my one year anniversary here. And uh, to know about me, I've had three major careers. Uh, started uh, with IBM as an engineer, systems engineer, then went back into higher education, run uh, a a a engineering access programs uh, for my alma mater, and then uh, and now I'm doing diversity work uh, as well. Um, so three major career changes. So get, get, get used to it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Carl. And right down to you, Ms. Adele. Yeah, thank you. I'm Adele. I'm a fourth year political science and environmental studies student at Northeastern. Um, and I'm also one of the hub coordinators of Sunrise Northeastern, which is a climate and environmental justice organization here on campus. We're a chapter of the National Sunrise Movement. Um, and I guess what I'd want people to know about me is just like how important getting involved in Sunrise has been to me and the work we've done and community I've found there. It's really been, made me feel empowered in a way nothing else has. It's been foundational to how I see myself and my place in the world and defined what I want to do with the rest of my life. So, yeah. Very well done. Thank you to our panelists for introducing themselves. If you would like to know more about any of the panelists on your tables, there is actually a virtual agenda for tonight's meeting. And so QR codes again, y'all, QR codes again. Um, and so you can take a look at each of the bios for all the panelists um, there if you're interested in learning more about everyone's experience. So that said, now we get into the questions of the day, right? So for, um, for you, Carl, and your role on the campus, you've been doing a lot of DEI work. You have been a part of so many different um, uh, kind of initiatives to move the work forward in a deeper way than usually people think about DEI work or diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So what are some of the ways that you see um, your work connecting to opportunities for the Sustainability Hub. Yeah, so and one of the things, I, well, first of all, I want to thank you. Uh, thank, thank Leah for the invitation uh, to be a part of this because oftentimes conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion, and climate and climate justice uh, really operate in two separate uh, orbits. And uh, only recently, uh, I think with, with uh, frankly, with George Floyd's um, murder and, and a number of other things, that the conversations about equity uh, really have found its way across the board. Now, there are several of our colleagues who've been doing this for, for some time, but I think the mainstream conversation uh, is, is starting to come together. What really excites me about this initiative is, are, are really two things, process and product. The process uh, I'm referring to is the, is the use of the word hub. When I got here a little over a year ago, one of the things that I wanted to do was take inventory of all of the diversity, equity, inclusion activities across the, at the time, 11 or 12 campuses. And, uh, and I, I categorized them. I'm an engineer, right? So I put them all in categories, and I came up to about over 300, nearly 300 activities across the, 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 the university. And, and there's a lot, a lot of good things that were happening uh, as well. Unfortunately, uh, my, my, um, my mentor, the former uh, president of MIT, Susan Hockfield, when we kind of introduced the, the notion of diversity, said that about diversity at MIT and probably a lot of other places, including here at Northeastern, that there are a lot of flowers, but there's no garden. A lot of efforts, a lot of spinning the wheels, a lot of activities, and we can't confuse activity with impact as well. 
And the, the, the kind of a knee-jerk reaction in a lot of this work is, let's, let's do something, right? Let's have an event. Let's have a discussion, a dialogue, et cetera. Very similar in here in the, on the climate, in the climate justice space as well. A lot of faculty doing great work. A lot of students are doing great work. Uh, Leah just highlighted a few of it. And it's just, it's all over the place. But when we ask the question, to what effect? What's the impact? No one can really answer that question. And the same is true for the diversity, equity, inclusion as well. And so one of the things that I uh, really am I'm a big fan of is this whole notion of collective impact. Um, based on an article uh, written at the Stanford, by the Stanford Innovation uh, Review in 2011, talks about public-private partnerships coming together to solve complex problems, childhood obesity, increasing the percentage of kids ready for kindergarten in a region, or cleaning up the water table in the Chesapeake Bay, et cetera. Putting together efforts, and collective impact has five major components. There's a common agenda. Everybody agrees that these are the things that we're gonna focus on. So for those of you who remember physics, it's pointing all the vectors in the same direction, right? Everybody's agreeing that this is what we're gonna do. Number two, shared measurement metrics. You got to know where you're going, right? You know, and how you measure yourself, measure to get there. But everybody agrees that this is how we're going to measure. It's not playing one game, one 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 metric set of metrics by one group and another set of metrics as, as well. The third is um, uh, mutually reinforcing activities. So everybody who's doing work pointing in the same, um, same direction, making sure that the work that they're doing is having this kind of impact that, that's, that's necessary. The fourth is constant communication, and the fifth is having a backbone. So what appeals to me about this hub is that the hub is a backbone. It brings together all these efforts and has the potential of creating this common agenda, shared measurement metrics, constant communication, and mutually reinforcing activities, all pointing to some outcome, to some effect uh, as well. So that's really a key, is about the process. And then the last thing I'll just say is about the product. At the end of the day, what are we producing? We're, we have to kind of ask ourselves what we're producing. When we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, it's, it's com compositional representation. We are very fortunate that our president two years ago made a bold announcement that the university at the faculty, staff, and student level would be representative of society and the nation in which we operate, where we, where we, where we learn, where we teach, where we, uh, where we do research as well. We are establishing, we need to establish that bold kind of objective uh, as well. And I'll just kind of close by just saying that Northeastern is a finalist on the Governor's Island Project um, uh, out of New York, and it's one of four institutions that were enabled as a finalist. And that will, if we're funded and if we're awarded this grant, it's a $150 million effort to establish a climate solutions center in New York. They will have certainly reciprocal uh, connections with the sustainability hub here, but more importantly, there are four major kind of elements that are associated with this that I think are really important for us to think about. One, it's a, a living and learning lab, right? A research lab. And the research lab has got to be representative, as Leah talked about earlier, of the people who are directly and most affected by climate, climate change. Number two, it's a center where people can come and learn, so it's kind of a destination place. We have to think about how do we involve the community in a much more proactive way that's not exploitive, as Rebecca Riccio kind of talked about as well. Number three, we have to work on creating new ventures, new businesses that are minority-owned and women-owned businesses that can actually address the climate space. So we're building kind of an economic uh, force in, in that. And then the fourth is workforce development making sure that the future workforce looks like the countries and looks like the, the countries in which, um, that are most directly affected by that. So I think that from a DEI standpoint, we should be thinking about all of the kind of elements that would sort of be transformative and have a big and bold vision for us to run after. And very similar to diversity, equity, inclusion, the climate um, adaptation, climate justice is key uh, to, to really seeing a transformative um, future for not just our university, but really our world.
Thank you so much for that, Carl. And I just want to reinforce some things that were said, um, especially because we have our wonderful visual note taker over here, Karen, trying to keep up with us. Uh, so one, that we're talking about process and product, right, as being the two key things that are important for equity. Um, and in terms of process and ways that we can have a meaningful process, modeling ourselves after collective impact. Um, and so just wanted to reinforce those ideas um, and, and, um, and say thank you for that. Um, and just from a, um, a community perspective, um, there's also, I think, opportunity, like when we talk about um, who are the stakeholders who are part of collective impact and how do we determine that common agenda in those shared metrics that throughout the process, community members are part of the process, right? Oftentimes, we kind of have these moments where we want them to be. We're like, okay, we've decided on some things and they're gonna come in at this point. Um, whereas if we're do being uh, fully equitable, right, we're involving people from the beginning, right? From that shared agenda point all the way through to um, uh, how we do day, uh, regular operations um, for the work that we're doing. You know, I mean, I think flipping the script, right? We're not the experts, the community is the exactly. experts. And I think if we kind of go into the relationship in that way, it changes the whole dynamic. Yes, and, and oftentimes I'll refer to that as context experts versus the content technical experts, right? right? right. And that you need both um, in order to really deal with these issues. Thank you for reinforcing that point. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come next to Joan, okay. um, to Professor Fitzgerald, in order to really talk about how do you see Northeastern's faculty um, and staff playing a role in the Sustainability Hub. Where are those opportunities? Great, thank you. Um, for faculty, the way we can engage and contribute are two, our research and our engagement. And once in a while, you get opportunities to combine them in one project. And so I'm gonna start with one project that I'm working on and then expand that into where, where else I think we can go. So as Leah mentioned earlier, um, our team at the Dukakis Center is leading an initiative funded by the Boston Foundation to evaluate Boston's climate action. And um, you probably all know Boston is considered a leader on, on climate action. Um, and Boston is one of the few cities that assesses how well it's doing on that. But when they do that, they'll say, here's a goal is it in process, is it completed, or is it underway? Um, that's not really providing an understanding of why we aren't getting to where we need to be. And that is the case in Boston. We're not going to be able to meet the goals to be carbon uh, neutral or net zero by 2050 with the path we're on now. So what we're trying to do in this assessment that's going to continue on as a biannual assessment is ask why and understand the barriers to what needs to be done. So are they the right goals? Um, but those barriers are really important and we've identified 11 possibilities so far in looking at um, you know, what if the goals don't align with state policy or with what the utilities want to do? Or what if there's conflicting goals? Or what if there's contradictory goals? Uh, what if there's trade-offs between employing one thing or another? So we've identified those in, our, in each area of Boston's ad adaptation and resilience planning and its uh, mitigation planning will be assessing that as well as looking at how is the private sector doing? How are higher education institutions doing contributing to Boston's uh, climate agenda? But the most important part of this project for me is that we're developing equity indicators and how well is Boston doing moving toward climate justice? And to that end, we have a stakeholder group um, that hits on many of the points that, that you made, Carl, in that we're engaging them to co-create the equity indicators. I could look at what cities could do. We as experts could, could develop those. But it's the people who are living in the frontline communities of Boston um, who know the day-to-day -day 
uh, reality of how climate change affects them, about what they need in their community. And it's in those stakeholder meetings that we will be able to figure that out. And um, I'm just really pleased that this kind of in community engagement is a key part of what we're doing. Um, I've, been, I've spent a long time at two institutions that have encroached upon their communities. The first one was the University of Illinois Chicago, uh, where we plunked ourselves down in the middle of a neighborhood and then just kept pushing the people who lived there out. Um, Northeastern has been here for a long time, but one could fairly say we are encroaching upon the community. So I think the spirit of all the comments tonight have been really important to look at, well, what can we do working with communities, building on their expertise to um, improve the quality of life? So earlier I said my work on cities focuses on linking economic opportunity, sustainability, or in this case, climate change, and, and um, growth. So I, I want to build on that in looking at what I think are some real opportunities for us. Right down the street from us, we have Madison Park, which is the city's key vocational school. Um, it has not performed well at all. One of my first projects when I came to Northeastern University in 2000 was to lead an initiative for developing school to work in this program. And it was a school that defied any kind of reform. We got nowhere. Um, similarly, we have Roxbury Community College down the street. So when I look at what we could do there, I think about the Green New Deal. I think about the fact that Michelle Wu, our mayor, campaigned on this Green New Deal. And to me, of the essence of it is connecting to economic opportunity. Jobs and education are the key aspects of that. And so the kind of partnerships we might develop are saying, what are the jobs in the green economy? A lot of them have start with engineering, various parts of engineering. There's technical jobs in terms of heating and plumbing. And there's urban design jobs. And so we have a lot to build on in Northeastern to work with these institutions to create new green technology hubs. So in previous events, um, we had Professor Richard Harris uh, here who's in, in, in the engineering school and has a program called NU Program in Multicultural en Engineering um, that goes by New Prime that recruits and nurtures black and Latino engineering students. That is one way we could build on doing well, doing good for the community, building that kind of resilience. Um, I'm involved along with, with Ted in an initiative led by Barry Reeves at the BPDA that's trying to develop urban design programming for these students. So, um, and that will possibly even begin this summer. I'm just going to do a quick acronym check. BPDA, Boston Planning and Development Agency, formerly Boston Redevelopment Authority. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Um, and so anyway, I, I, I guess I'll just conclude by saying there's lots of opportunities for us to make this triple you know, in, intervention in our surrounding community and see Northeastern building more resilient communities, but I think more importantly, creating economic, economic opportunities for students in nearby institutions. Mm -hmm. And Professor Fitzgerald loves when I, um, or I follow her and, and say things like workforce development and entrepreneurial development, right? And so a lot of times when we talk about community and economic development, we think jobs. And yes, those are important. And we don't even have enough businesses to do all of the work we need right. to do to move into the green economy. And so how do we also develop pipelines for entrepreneurship as well as we're thinking about this? Venture creation. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and that and could be part of it, absolutely. Mm -hmm.
Um, so thank you for, for connecting those dots for us and bringing us to resilience. I've been paying attention to the visual note taker and it looks like she caught most of what you said. So I will not paraphrase in uh, this instance. Um, and so thank you so much, Professor Fitzgerald. One follow-up um, question I would ask is, so from a Northeastern staff perspective, um, where do you see the biggest um, opportunities for um, them to connect to, be a part of, or support the sustainability hub? From a, from a faculty and staff? Fa or? Faculty and staff perspective. And staff. Well, I think um, one of the things we, we need to do is across colleges, look at initiatives like that mm -hmm. and to say, okay, who do we need on board to make a project like that happen? to get funding for it, but partly Northeastern has to make that investment. Hmm. And so I find it interesting that the head of DEI for the Boston Planning and Development Agency is the one who initiated a group of people to do this. And I think we at Northeastern need to initiate um, some partnerships like this where we're collectively working in um, neighborhood organizations and institutions. There's that collective impact showing up again, y'all. So um, I'm going to come to Ms. Adele, who uh, has been patiently waiting, and thank you. Um, <laughs> but by design, I have saved my question for you for last. Um, and so we know that you have been involved in a very um, a leadership role in helping to hold the university accountable from the student perspective. And so what can we learn from um, those student perspectives and um, how can we leverage um, the students' um, uh, knowledge um, and participation in the Sustainability Hub? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. I really appreciate being on this panel. Um, and to answer that question and kind of to explain the goals of Sunrise Northeastern a bit, um, there is definitely a lot of people and a lot of like organizations within Northeastern doing really great work, but I do think students have a very unique position that allows us to do certain things. In many ways, it allows us to act and speak more radically and less censored because we're not employed by the university. Um, and there is also this energy that student movements often have because we're drawing on this constantly renewing pool of students. I know I remember coming to Northeastern and discovering things like Northeastern is invested in fossil fuels. Um, we're currently having this event in an amphitheater that's named after Raytheon, a weapons manufacturer and a company that has said that it sees climate change as a business opportunity. We are every year um, admitting more students than we can responsibly house to the detriment of our students and the surrounding community. Um, and learning that we are not treat I'm paying our dining hall workers a living wage. Um, and I've seen other students realize that as they come in. And I think that can make student movements sometimes have like, oh my god, everything is so messed up and want to do like everything at once and change everything. And I think that that is important because I think in many ways that gets to the heart of the issue more than other things do at times. And I know at least in Sunrise Northeastern, there's a shared understanding that um, despite how many great people there are at Northeastern, people who have a lot of decision making power within Northeastern fundamentally see its goals as very related to things like Northeastern's image, the money it's bringing in, its ability to expand, and its prestige. And that is such, and what we need to get to is something where the university is putting people, whether it's students, people who work here, with the surrounding community, and the planet first. And I think our position allows us to be really honest of how radical of a shift that is, and how much that would have to change everything at the university. And I think it is the fact that like, that's not unique to Northeastern. That's part of so many like, higher education institutions like this. And that makes it every bit more important because as we start to experience the effects of climate change, we need institutions that are going to take care of us and allow us to take care of each other and not ones that are going to take advantage of existing systems of oppression 
and exploit people to hold on to the power and influence that they have as the crisis hits. And I think where student organizations and student movements are at their most powerful is when they have this understanding of the root of the problem, and then they then take the step to reimagine their universities. And this isn't a new thing. This is what students did during the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. And it's also part of what we're trying to do now. Um, so many student groups are doing great work, but to talk about the work we're specifically doing, Sunrise Northeastern has been talking. I, I keep moving over here because that's where <laughs> a lot of them are sitting. Um, Sunrise Northeastern has um, been talking for years about like a green NEU deal, fun pun, based on the national green NEU deal. And it's basically like, what would it be if we imagined a Northeastern that really centered itself around climate justice, racial justice, economic justice? Um, and I think that's so important because with climate change and as an environmental studies major, I've just felt this the way, the more I know about climate change, it can be so hard to imagine how we can get where we need to be, how we can really get to a system that is just and sustainable because that is so far from what we have. And that's why having spaces like to fully like reimagine how everything works and to make that feel real in a community and institution you're part of and like how that would affect your daily life is so incredibly important. Um, and and yeah, and so like if, if we could change a university, like maybe that's a small thing, but like really making that feel real and living our solutions. And everyone who goes through the Northeastern and goes on into their lives, having that image of what that is and what that means and what it is to come together and decide our values together is just so incredibly important. Um, and so what I would say when it comes to the uh, role of like the climate justice and sustainability hub, I think this is such an incredible start to that. Like inviting us to the table and creating that space to really talk about what our university could do and allowing radical voices to be part of that is so important mm -hmm. and I really appreciate it. And then I, I would just urge the climate justice and sustainability hub to continue to like even if we sound a little like super unrealistic sometimes, not grounded in the super specifics of things, um, a little over too negative to understand like what our role in this is and how a lot of that is our strength. Mm. Mm. All right, so. <laughs> and for folks who are watching virtually, that, that was not just the students clapping. Everybody in here <laughs> is clapping. Um, and so what I want to reinforce, a couple of things that you said. Um, so one thing you said is, well, we're just going to change one school. But isn't that how, how change works, right? Like we take ownership for the stuff and the places and the people that we're connected to. And we figure out what we can do in those spaces. And if more, more of us across universities do that, and reimagine the possibilities, then we're able to have the kind of impact that's necessary. But it starts with our ownership of our own stuff, right? So thank you for saying that um, and, and all of your um, amazing words. The other thing that came up again was um, uh, this idea of the role of students and energy. So you talked about we bring energy. She definitely brought energy for me as someone <laughs> who uh, has been up since 5 o'clock this morning um, chasing stuff around. And, um, and part of that energy that you're bringing to this conversation that I want to um, uh, kind of ask you a follow-up question about is you know, Sunrise and other student organizations on campus are so important to the fabric of holding um, uh, the North, Northeastern University accountable, right? And, and the fabric of life here, in essence. Um, and so how do you sustain um, the knowledge that you learn from um, class to class as folks graduate? So, you know, you, you've done all this amazing work, you're here, you have this energy. How do you make sure that the folks who come after you are able to learn from that so that folks like the Sustainability Hub can learn from the cumulative knowledge? Yeah, uh, you've kind of asked like the internal question of student organizing. <laughs> um, that is definitely like, the, with the energy comes that. Yeah. I mean, I think um, something North, Sunrise Northeastern is trying to do right now is really like, 
writing down our values and like how we see the world and what we want to do um, and having like us revisit that time and time over again every year, having um, traditions of things we do so we know that those things and those things can pass on, building relationships um, and mentoring other members, building relationships with different organizations and like across different colleges that can last. Um, Definitely uh, an ongoing process and struggle, but I, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And so I'm gonna bring up an, an issue and anyone can jump in on these, the things that I'm about to uh, ask next. Um, so we know that kind of Northeastern has a reputation, a history and from the perspective of community. And Leah went through um, in some of her slides some of those realities that communities have experienced because of the relationship that needs to be rebuilt, right, with community in Northeastern. And so, um, what are some of the the possibilities you see for Northeastern being able to, through the Sustainability Hub, being able to um, address some of those issues? So, what are some of those issues you're aware of, right? And what are some of the things that ways that we can address some of those issues? One of the things that um, my office, the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, we talked about uh, creating a true community. Mm. And true is an acronym for trust, relationships, and respect, understanding, and empathy. Trust, relationships, and respect, understanding, and empathy. And I think that, the, that, that has to be a leading um, value of us um, engaging in the community because um, we've got to build trust. We have to forge relationships. We have to understand what the problems and the challenges that, that uh, members of our, 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 our proximal communities are addressing. And we know what a lot of them are, right, that we're kind of articulating. It's, it's, it's venture creation. It's, it's, it's economic development. It's housing. It's, it's it's education, it's, you know, it's basically we, we, we already know what a lot of this, but I think it's important not, not that the chief inclusion officer articulate that, it's important that, that our, our partners articulate what that is. And um, I think Jim Collins often says, getting the right people on the bus before we know where the bus is going. I think, I think not coming in with an agenda, mm -hmm. but coming in with, with two ears and listening I think is, is critical. Uh, there's a reason why we have two ears and one mouth, right? We should be listening twice as much as we should be speaking. And that's so hard for a university to do because mm -hmm. we are really trained and, are, and socialized to speak. Mm -hmm. But I think just this really understanding and articulating what the, the challenges and, and the problems are. I often say the reason diversity matters is, 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 is people, process, and problem. Diversity helps to define the problems that we ultimately seek to solve. It helps us to define the people or work with the people who are actually experiencing some of the challenges and can help us with solutions. And because diversity, we can innovate and create new innovative processes for this as well. Mm -hmm. So people, problems, and process. And we have to understand what, what we have done, how we have been complicit in reinforcing racial and social inequities, um, not as I'm talking, that's not the new Northeastern, et cetera, but all these institutions mm -hmm. that are here, and then really start working to dismantle those. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to contribute? Just build on that a little bit to say it's really important to go in and, and listen. You're right, but I think it's more important to deliver um, after you've after you've been listening. And sometimes what the community will come to you and say, this is what we want, is not what you intended to provide. Um, but if you're asking the question, we have to be prepared to deliver. And I think an aspect of that is, I can never remember the name of the building that's going up that we're, we're going to build right next to Renaissance Park. But you know, that's been controversial within the community. And why aren't we thinking of ways to open that up and be something that's welcoming to the community? And whether it's space you know, for entrepreneurial venture development or something 
um, the ideas that I mentioned before with the school, mm -hmm. but we, we really have to deliver mm -hmm. on what we're talking so or we have, listening to. So we have to listen and deliver. So what is in our way um, or where are there opportunities to address barriers to delivering? Because um, it seems like there's, there's, there's a, some, maybe some stories there that we can learn from um, to answer this question of where are some of those opportunities to address those barriers? And you don't have to be the only one to answer. <laughs> I don't think there's, there's anything in our way at all. Mm. We just have to decide it's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So no political will, potentially? Potentially. Okay. And just, just an example, I, I will just kind of really offer this, the, the 840 Columbus Avenue. We've had, okay. what, three or four design charrettes with members of the community where we listened and understood what, their, what the members in this BDPA and others who really, not BDPA, but we have an advisory, um, uh, a com community advisory council we brought in, et cetera. And so the, the plan for that around the first five floors is, is really opening up uh, for, for, for members of the community and, and sort of venture creation, uh, workforce development, et cetera, and this whole idea of, of ambassadors. So there are, there are opportunities for us to do that. I think it's consistency, I think is really what you, you kind of uh, address, which is, which, is, which is, you know, over time, can we kind of establish a, a five or 10 year kind of vision for our engagement and then sort of build on that over time, right? And I think that that's, that that's possible. I think to your point, it's within the realm of possibilities. It's just, just a matter of sort of having the vision and the commitment uh, and, 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 and being able to sustain that as well. I would Thanks. just add that we should front load it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Adele, did you want to add something to this? Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree uh, with a lot of the other panelists that, um, like, some, some of the part of the goals that have been explained to me of that's been most meaningful to me is like the idea of healing our relationship with the community because I think that's really important. I think if we were a university that was really like responding, like trying, listening to the community and actually trying to like fix problems, like benefit the community in collaboration with them, that would be an incredible thing. I do worry that, uh, I worry that the efforts of the Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub won't be reflected by the rest of the university in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, and I think, again, that like consistency is important, that there's not just this like one part of Northeastern that says this one thing um, and other parts that say the other, other things. Um, but something else I think that the um, Sustainability Hub can really do is really like bring, bring people together and be a coordinating force. And I know they've tried to do a lot of that so far. I just feel like as student organizers, we're always like, oh, we should talk to all of these people and like do all these things, but then classes get in the way and we're trying to do so many things that like mm -hmm. really building those spaces and connections and talking to other people can be kind of difficult. Um, and I, so I think that that's something that's really valuable that they can provide. Thank you so much for adding that. And I'm going to uh, uh, reinforce some of the things that were said for the um, visual note taker. Um, so Karen, um, true is trust, relationships. Understanding. Understanding, Empire. she's right in relationships oh. now. Okay. Um, she has understanding and empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and so as, as we think about where the, the possibilities are for the sustainability hub, one of the other, um, one of the themes that is kind of foundational to this whole conversation and even what Leah has presented has been this idea of collective impact. It keeps coming up in different words and ways. Um, and if you're not familiar with collective impact, highly recommend you look it up. It is really a powerful concept um, that I know I used when I was in government as well, um, uh, dealing with um, tr trying to bring together community and government and private sector partners to solve the, the challenges that we have to deal with because we all play different roles and none of us have all the answers. Now, from, a, um, from the perspective of um, the, the way that the Climate Justice Hub can connect to existing movements, right? So we oftentimes talk about climate justice. There's also been this whole thing going on in communities called environmental justice. Mm -hmm. right? 
And so what are some of the um, uh, ways that um, we can build on top of the environmental justice stuff that's been happening in communities for decades um, and, and that can inform how we think about climate justice and collaboration? Where, where, where do you see some of um, those opportunities? I think from kind of a, I'm trying to think of the cl climate justice hub connection, but there's often been a disconnect between environmental justice action and city government. Mm. And how do, how do you connect that? And so I think, you know, what's really interesting in having Leah be the person here is she's had experience in city government. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to see those connections, like there's university community connections and city community connections, but to, to, to be able to link those, I think we're in somewhat of a unique position because of your, your background. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think to provide context, or at least how I see like the difference between the two, I mean, environmental justice usually refers to like the movements um, historically, like in mainly black communities and communities of color to resist polluting industries and things like that in their communities. And the climate justice movement is more um, a part of the like climate movement that's talking about how the impacts of climate change are like distributed, uh, uh, oh my God, I'm forgetting the word, but like inconsistently. But I think that in many ways, a lot of the thinkings, at least under my standing, the thinking of those movements have combined mm -hmm. a lot of the ways. And I mean, the way I think of it is just like that acknowledgement that the roots of the, the climate crisis isn't just, oh no, we accidentally started using carbon. But similar to what I said before, like the roots of the climate crisis is all the ways our system puts um, power and profit over people and the planet. So I guess just like, paying attention to the way that the people in those movements talk about these things, what they say their goals are, and how they approach things, and what the solutions they define as good and why, I just, is something to pay attention to, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for that. Did you want to add anything? Yes, You're good. good. So, um, and I'll share this just from an uh, uh, observation as both a community member, I'm wearing multiple hats, y'all. Community member, nerd as a, a academic, and um, a entrepreneur and former city employee. And so one of the, the things I've observed is that there's very, there are very different camps, right? Environmental justice and the climate justice pieces are very separate. Right, like the, the, the things that are happening and the tactics and the, the lear lessons learned in environmental justice don't always make it into the climate justice space. And it's not the same people um, who are in those conversations either. So as we think about the ways that we bring together community, it's a great opportunity for the sustainability hub as well. Um, and so we're, we're kind of here at the end. And so the, the, I wanna give folks the opportunity to close out. Um, meaningfully um, with what is it the most important takeaway that you want people who are watching through live stream as well as in this room to walk away with? Most important takeaway for you. Um, so I'll give you a few seconds mm -hmm. to just process that question. I, I, just, I just think that we, we've got to stop playing whack-a-mole right, on, on these really serious systems um, projects, I mean, problems that we are dealing with, whether it's racial justice and climate justice, environmental justice, climate action, sustainability, climate ad adaptation, et cetera. We've been sort of, you know, something pops up, a crisis comes, and we hit it down. And, and, and we, we, we have an opportunity to take a systems approach to this. Um, you know, you ask, I asked my staff the question, how do we solve homelessness in Boston? All right? We take a five minutes, and we started to kind of come up with all these different ideas. And I said, yes, all of the above. Right? We have to increase capacity. We have to have housing. We have to have education. We have to have mental health, et cetera, et cetera. We need a systems approach to some of these, these, these challenges. 
and not worry, not kind of just address some of the, the crises that pop up so that when, when our students graduate and move on, that this work continues as well. And so I think that there's a, there's a great opportunity with this, with this hub for us to kind of think systematically and strategically and, and start to dismantle the things that reinforce the kind of inequities that we see. Thank you. Adela Jones? Well, I guess one of the, the terms that came up in our conversation was the lack of political will. Mm. And I, I will point out right now, I think we are in a very unique moment. We have just elected a mayor, again, on a Green New Deal, who climate justice is really very close to her, to her agenda. Um, we're likely to have a new Maura Healy as governor, if the polls are, are correct now, who also has just put out a, a very strong climate plan. Um, Andrea Campbell, who also has a strong climate plan, is likely to be our attorney general. So it's like all the stars are lined up. And I know you pointed out the university isn't where it needs to be on that agenda, but by creating this climate hub, I mean, we could be part of something that, not just Northeastern, but looking to Massachusetts and Boston for our combining climate action to a climate justice agenda. And hopefully that will, that will be happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Adele? Yeah, I guess what I'd say, and this is more, I guess, to students, would be that, like, I feel like when we think about our future and issues like climate change and how we want to approach them, it can be so depressing and hard to know where to start. I mean, like, oh, vote every four years and like buy these certain specific clothes. But I, I just want to like reiterate that we do have the power to come together and talk about the world we want to live in and create and do concrete things and organize to make that happen. And that also can include doing fun, silly, goofy stuff with your friends. And um, it's great. And yeah, we have the power to do that. Thank you so much. And I will wrap us up by saying, number one, thank you so much to Leah for um, her leadership and for kicking us off in this way to really explore the possibilities. Thank you to all of the panelists for your amazing contributions to the conversation and really leading the way in exploring those opportunities. Um, and what I will um, share from my perspective and what I hope um, is taken away from this conversation is the power of collaboration. Um, I think um, oftentimes we're rushing, things move fast, and we have to get all this stuff done. Um, and the, it, the urgency of things can make us feel like we don't have time to collaborate. The issue is it's a pay now or pay later kind of thing, right? If you don't do it now, you're gonna spend way more time, energy, and resources on the back end trying to justify why you did something that didn't make sense because you didn't collaborate. Um, the second thing um, that I hope folks uh, walk away uh, uh, from this conversation from a community perspective is that engaging with the community costs money, right? There, it costs money. So if you're going to do, engage in the community, it actually has to be a line item to cover the cost of what it takes to engage with the community from the, the effort on the ground that it takes um, all the way through to um, compensating people for their time for giving their expertise in the same way that staff, faculty are being um, uh, paid to participate in these situations. So I just want to say thank you all so much for being here with us. Thank you for everyone who is uh, streaming, watching us through streaming. And we get to adjourn and spend some quality time with each other to wrap up. Wrap up oh my class. goodness, there is Hello. 10 minutes, Mark. <laughs> you snuck in there on us. I did. Um, I guess I want to remind folks that um, not only are we in a moment of substantial political change at this moment, uh, as uh, Professor Fitzgerald has pointed out, um, we're at a point of substantial administrative change as well. Uh, many of our agencies, many of our universities, are seeing uh, both expansion 
and uh, the change in people um, who have been working on issues of sustainability and resilience and energy use for quite some time. And all of us need to not only look at that change, but think about what it takes to change the views of the institutions uh, that we've worked with, and also to bring about a certain amount of cultural change within ourselves. Um, many of our students have asked me, for example, how can we stop gentrification in our neighborhoods? And then I remind folks that, in fact, we are, to a large extent, the gentrifiers in our neighborhoods as we move into them. And students ask me, how can we get institutions to change the way we think about energy use? And then I ask them, would they be willing to take the orange line downtown rather than calling for an Uber or a Lyft? And we talk about the need to change uh, many of our consumer practices and policies around energy use. And I have to ask people, would you be willing to give up the quick delivery that you get from Amazon when you need ink for your printer? So a lot of what we have to think about in terms of the changes uh, that we need to deal with in terms of climate justice are, in fact, changes within ourselves and changes within our own view of culture. And we need to not only talk about the need for certain types of change, we need to, in fact, implement that change not so much on others, but on ourselves. So I would ask us to leave today's conversation and the uh, unveiling, the launch of the hub here, to think about what we do personally, as well as to think about what it is we plan to do uh, together, collaboratively, to bring about certain types of change. And this semester, uh, through the open classroom, we've dealt with a lot of issues on how we involve with communities and how we help to support communities. And I would conclude uh, our thinking this semester by saying the first community we need to think about changing is our own. That we need to not think about what we're doing in relation to others, but we also need to think about this in relation to our own behaviors. And so I turn the podium over to uh, my colleague, uh, Rebecca, who can close us out. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause to the great Ted Landsmark? I want to, to thank Ted for giving us open classroom this semester to focus on these issues of community engagement and what it means to do in an ethical and anti-oppressive way. I'd like to thank Dr. Martin, Joan, Carl, and Adele. Thank you for your courage to say what you said tonight. It is not easy to stand up here as a student and call and speak truth to power. Thank you. The courage to speak to power, I think, ties together so many of the themes from the semester. Why should it take courage for a young person to speak the truth about what needs to be done to save their future? It's actually tied to Carl's call for us to change systems. Because over the course of the semester, whether we were looking at farm workers or the victims of sexual violence or social and, and economic and racial justice, who is on the receiving end of the system's problems? It is the least powerful. It is the people of color. It is the queer folks. It is the young folks. It is the undocumented folks. And so if we are to address these issues and be true systems thinkers, we need to understand that they inherently favor the powerful. And that those of us who have the power to engage in social change who dare to insert ourselves into other people's lives and into other people's communities with the intention to help or change, need to recognize that we are able to do that because we are inherently in positions of power, because of where we work, or because of our control of resources. 
And so in 2022, we have to have a reckoning with our own power and positionality and the systems that are perpetuating the inequity and inequality that we purport to fight. And so I encourage us all to remember, as Ted said, change has to begin with us and in our own communities. And we make it seem like it's so hard, but it's really the simplest of values that it must begin with. Respecting others, honoring relationships, maintaining our own integrity, being truthful, as Carl said. I love your list, Carl. We have understood those truths for time eternal. It's not always about coming up with the newest and brightest and most innovative solution. Sometimes it's about going back to basics and remembering who we need to be as humans in community with others. I wanna thank everybody who has joined us all semester for this uh, open classroom, for these amazing conversations. This will be our last event. We had to postpone next week's talk until the fall. So for those of you who are joining us online and have been all semester, thank you. For those who are here celebrating the opening of the new hub, thank you. I believe there may be still some food here. Um, and to everybody here, in solidarity, the work continues. Thank you. All right, well that concludes uh, the formal program and I hope everyone can stay and socialize. Uh, there's still some food left. Um, there's some, looks like some cook cookies. Um, and please, if you grabbed a mug, those are yours to keep, our, as are the little sporks. Um, we're trying to, to get those reusable items out there. Um, and I feel like there was one. Oh, and the notes, leave those behind or hand them to a member of, of our team at the Hub. We want to really make sure we hear from you. I also want to just give a, a thank you and round of applause for Karen for capturing the conversation so beautifully over there. And I, I hope you'll, you'll stay and hang out for a bit. Thank you.